Happy New Year. Happy 2024. Big things are coming in 2024, and we're excited to uh, to come along with you for the ride. He's Zach Blackerby. I'm Brad Law. It's Village Vice. Zach, Auburn football hires Charles Kelly, an Auburn mm. guy, an Auburn alum, the number one recruiter in the country, according to people who do that. And uh, now he's coming to work on this Hugh Freeze staff. You got to think recruiting was was the main focus here as Hugh Freeze and this staff have certainly made that a priority. And you can tell the end product, you can tell with the talent they're acquiring, which long term is certainly the future of this program. Um, it makes sense. You know, when the news originally broke, it's like, okay, is he taking Coach Crime's spot? And then, you know, of course, he pops up elsewhere, following uh, going with Mike Elko to AM. But you know, this is a guy, like, it makes sense. It's such a veteran move. And it sounds like Deion Sanders wasn't particularly happy about it, which that's always a good thing. Yeah, for, for sure. Now, Colorado staff has a bunch of turnover, but this one's easy. This is yeah. a this is an upward move. It's a move to the SEC. It's a move back to his alma mater um, and uh, just tons of upside. So, yeah, Coach Crime goes to A&M and the, the title, at, at least, you know, in this first few days since the hire, co-defensive coordinator, and uh, he'll work with Zach Etheridge in the secondary. He's got a lot of history there. Uh, was the uh, associate or assistant DC, basically a co-D coordinator at Alabama and safeties coach for four years, and uh, then spent this one season at Colorado. And again, number one recruiter in the country. That's a designation not to be taken lightly. He has landed some huge fish as a primary and secondary recruiter in his time. Yeah, and, and you said it, his time at Alabama, I mean, that's going to be invaluable job experience for what he's going to be able to do at Auburn. And that's why that's why Coach Prime wanted to hold on to him. I'm sure Nick Saban wanted to hold on to him, and he's valued on every staff that he goes to. So, I mean, this is a huge, huge hire, and I think the timing of this news being released one, uh, I was told Dion was was ticked about this, and so he leaked the news before Auburn was really ready. And I think it caught some members of the staff a little off guard. Brad, we'll see if there's any like trickle down effect of yeah. of that timing if Dion gets what he wants from that. But the the timing of this hire got covered up a little bit just for the nature of there was a football game that Auburn fans were going to be focused on. And then, you know, the the sadness and the outrage that came from that game, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this is a big deal. Yeah. Espe especially when, when Hugh Freeze and the staff have kind of poked their chest out and said, we are going to recruit as good or better than anyone. And you go out and get the guy who's nationally renowned for bringing in top talent. And you talked about his experience at coaching safeties and defensive backs, putting a lot of guys into the NFL. This is a big deal and it's a big move. Yeah, uh, it is. It's a it's a net gain for Auburn, I think. And I and I like Coach Crime and, and there's no question that he's an sure. accomplished coach and and uh will do good things at Texas AM. But I think net gain, net loss, this is a net gain for Auburn. Um it's a guy who's universally loved, respected. He just they like him and that makes him in these closing situations in recruiting. When you talk about developing relationships, right. um, he closes very well. So um, you now have two Auburn guys working with your secondary. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an interesting little twist as well as those roots dig in a little bit deeper. Will there be more coaching changes this offseason? Brad, that was one of our buy sells this past week. And I think we both yeah. sold, if I remember correctly, that something would happen. Something would happen to the coaching staff, and little did we know the next day yeah. uh, news would break. Yeah, as if there was any doubt that we're just sort of we're we're talking about what we think, right? It's it's not based on a ton of inside info all the time. So um sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But sure. Um I don't know. Again, I, I said that I didn't think the staff would change, but that would go against the trend. It's Got just it. so rare to not have any coaching turnover. The, that's a huge net, a huge network. And yeah, I think it's at this point, now that my buy-sell pick has already gone out the window, it's just the law of averages. You're going to have other changes. I think so. I mean, if you're going to give somebody the title of co-DC, he probably wants some say in the staff. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see 
we'll see what happens from that. But right now, if I had to guess, this is not it. This is yeah. not it regarding coaching staff changes for Hugh Freeze and the Auburn Tigers. But all in all, you you look ahead to this 2025 class, and sure, there's a few, maybe a few lo loose ends in 2024 with the class that they'll try to put together for the real signing day that happens in February. Yeah. But this staff's focus is going to be on 2025. And so you bring in Charles Kelly, who already has relationships with some of these kids just because Colorado, the nature of what Deion Sanders is doing there, they're yeah. recruiting nationally. And so he already knows who a lot of these kids are. Also just scouting ahead from his time at Alabama. He knows the state and these high school coaches throughout the state so, so well. And to me, I mean, e even if he doesn't even coach any part of the scheme, which he will, that's his title and he's good at it. But even if he just recruits, even if he's just, you know, your recruiting coordinator, it's worth it. It's yeah. absolutely absolutely worth it well i think this is a it's a really savvy move too from the head coach who admitted to spending time away from offensive game plans several times in these first 12 13 months yeah in order to focus on recruiting so now the question is and what i think is interesting to watch is does this hire allow him to give coach kelly a little more of the recruiting load like some of his recruiting load and allow him to focus more on working with Coach Montgomery and the offensive game plan as, as you go throughout the season, in particular in closing the season next year when you're also getting closer to, to, to closing your recruiting class. I, I think that's something to watch. Yeah, the assumption is Hugh Freeze is going to call plays in 2024, and so he's put it out there publicly that in games where he's recruiting – heavily he's not going to be as involved in the game plan if you're not heavily involved in the game plan you can't call plays right so yeah. i think that i think that has to change so charles kelly can certainly be part of that and i also think just the nature of him not being as behind the eight ball now this will be his first really full class the 2025 class as far as getting guys in on campus before their senior year and really getting to know them as underclassmen you got to think the urgency, it'll still be there, but not anywhere close to the same level. I mean, this staff was behind because of the timing of when they came in and just the general, you know, this is kind of what happens when, when you when you change schools and you change yeah. jobs as a, and locations as a head coach. So I, I think a few things are going to kind of all point to the balance of Hugh Freeze being focused on the offense, um, ticking up uh, a little bit next year. Yeah, that's a good point. You have to run a little faster to try to catch up. You still have to keep a, a steady pace in recruiting. But yeah, you do have to work a little harder and, and push that wheel a little faster just to get into the the, the same flow that more established staffs are, are in. So that's a good point. A note about staffs, too, and staff changes. It's yeah. not always necessitated by a, a gap that needs to be filled because something is lacking in your own staff. We still have playoff games. Um, there are NFL hires that'll be made, and there's a trickle down effect at yeah. times, trickle down or trickle up, depending on the Good position. Point. So, um, Good that's, point. that the window is still very wide open. And there are guys that I think Auburn owes and needs to take care of, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw Tanner Burns step in uh, with Coach Crime kind of stepping off of his post, and we've already seen Coach Crime leave. But what happens with Tanner Burns? And it seems like Charles Kelly is kind of taking that spot but mm -hmm. you know, what about Trevon Reed does Auburn owe Trevon Reed something bigger you've got to think other schools are calling Trevon Reed because it's yeah. worth it what he's done and I think he could be a solid coach one day too but obviously you you risk that for what he's been able to prove on the recruiting trail and you yeah. just give him time to develop as a position coach you got to think at some point they're going to have to reward uh, Trevon Reed yeah. And that, to me, is one of the spots I'm looking at the closest right now. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, we've already also seen Kendall Simmons move on. He's he's with Derek mm -hmm. Mason at Middle Tennessee now. So, you know, you have a GA spot, a, a, an assistant spot that that will get backfilled somehow. Someday. Is that my second favorite coaching staff now? Probably. <laughs> Probably, I love those guys. It's hard not to be right. It's easy to it's easy to like Derek Mason. It's very easy to like Kendall Simmons. Totally. I don't know who else he's put on that staff yet, but maybe Doesn't it's matter. worth, worth investigating. Matter. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, Brad. You and I talked about it our last show before the game. Uh, we both took Auburn 
to cover. So sorry if you listen to us. But head over to mybookie.ag and they'll they'll throw some extra cash your way when you sign up and use promo code next round, or you won't even feel it. You won't even feel it. But seriously, uh, if you're watching this uh, the day it goes up before the college football playoff games, get in on the action. Mybookie.ag. They've got so many things going on with player props, parlays, money lines, uh, futures. If you're going ahead and looking at 2024, they've got all sorts of stuff. Um, at mybookie.ag and be sure to use promo code next round. You know what's interesting? What's that? Derek Mason, uh, you know who's wide receivers coach is at Middle Tennessee? No, who is it? Cornelius Williams. No way. Yeah, yeah. Worked with him for just a few months at Auburn. And Man, Brian Carson enough. let go of that guy and he had us convinced that that was the problem. <laughs> yep. I hope, I hope he gets a... Hope he gets a better chance there. Yeah, Good for him. Good I gotta for him. think that he will. I gotta think. Yeah, so. I, I think so. I think <laughs> so. Uh, bowl reaction. I mean, obviously that didn't go well. Yeah, Brad and you and I were chit chatting before we clicked record. There's so. I think you have to look at every element of a bowl game differently than you look at every element of a regular season game or a game that quote unquote matters. Yeah, and. I'm not making excuses. I think what Auburn did in Nashville, the Music City Bowl against Maryland, I, I think it was unacceptable. Like I think it was really, really bad. I thought Auburn would win. I thought Auburn would want to put uh, a better product on the field as far as execution and the individual player. I, I thought the effort would be there more. Props yeah. to Maryland. Maryland certainly wanted it more. And you and I talked about that. 80% of these bowl games is who wants it more. And yeah. I don't think there's any question that Maryland wanted it more than Auburn on Saturday, which surprises me. But when you look at these individual moments and individual kind of takeaways from the game, Brad, what can you take away from Saturday that you think legitimately matters Yeah, in the 2024 season? This is hard for me, and I'm going to admit this is difficult for me because I don't okay. want to come across as the – well, we lost, so it doesn't matter. And if we had won, it would matter a lot more. I, I want to try to be consistent. And I don't I, – like, I wish we wouldn't count bowl game stats. I wish we wouldn't count bowl games as part of the final record. I don't like teams that win nine and then they win their bowl game and it's a 10-win season. So I'm not even saying it because it's a loss. Okay. I think I, I think that the current state of bowl games – and Kirby Smart said it after, and they were in a New Year's Six Bowl. They were in a big game, big game. And he said it after. He said, you got to decide what you want, and you got to fix it. Because what it is right now ain't it. So with that disclaimer thrown out there to coat this whole thing, I don't know how much you take. I'll, I'll tell you this. I liked the fact that they made adjustments after the first quarter. Yeah. Very clearly not having Marcus Harris on the field made a difference. Very clear, like inarguably not mm -hmm. having the two starting corners on the field made a difference. Early on. Sure. Early. Right. And then adjustments were made um, and they didn't allow an offensive touchdown the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. I was most surprised that the offensive line didn't get a better push. Now you can argue Maryland's defense, the same Maryland team that, you know, was within a touchdown of Michigan, like Auburn was within a touchdown of, of Georgia and Ole Miss and Alabama. Um, they focused on stopping the run, and that was why they were able to have success. I just, I thought the line would get a better push up front than what it did throughout the game. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the offensive line struggling is my biggest concern from that game that we take into 2024. I think there are other concerns from that game, but as far as looking at this through the lens of what matters for next season, the offensive line is going to be pretty similar. It's going to be pretty similar next year. You lose Gunnar Britton, but outside of that, we're expecting a lot of these guys to come back. Avery Jones leaving stinks, but like Connor Lou's so good, we're kind of forgetting about him. But I mean, he was a pretty solid center for a good chunk of the season. Yeah. But – you know, Connor Lou played all but I think 10 offensive snaps in the bowl game. So I mean that that wasn't because he like wasn't on the field. Yeah. So I'm with you. I think offensive line was concerning, both from a push standpoint in the running game, but also 
Uh, Brad, I mean, from a pass protection standpoint, Peyton clearly wasn't comfortable, and it still just seems to tick behind schedule yeah. on every on almost every snap where it's like it's like he's not getting off of his first read quick enough or the the receiver's not breaking open quick enough and he's staying locked in on a certain guy. And then at that point, you can tell is when he starts looking around in the pocket. And yeah. that's not how you that's not how you win games. But receivers, I still aren't don't think he's I, I think after Saturday, Brad, you have to go get a quarterback in the portal or at least try because I, right. I think I think there's too many questions about Peyton Thorne. But all of these things that we're speculating about, I kind of think they would have been there regardless of if Auburn struggled in the Music City Bowl or not. Like there's still questions about the O-line. There's still questions about the quarterback. I felt good about the uh, the the freshman corners already and I I feel even better about them now. And my biggest concern is probably from the defensive line as well. Like, you just need more bodies. But we all knew that going into that game, too. So, I don't know if it really changed my mind on anything other than leaning into the quarterback pursuit in the portal a little bit harder. I, I think you've got to do something there. All right, that's an interesting point, and I want to talk about it more as we we discuss. Because Hugh Freeze, after the game, said, open quarterback battle in spring. Hmm. And so let's talk about that after we talk about Manscaped. I love talking about Manscaped, and we're going to talk about them more in 2024. How about more in 24? That's what we wow. say about Manscaped. Uh, and if you want more out of your personal grooming, then you need to go to manscaped.com. Use promo code VICE, V-I-C-E. Get 20% off and free shipping. The Lawnmower 5.0 is here. It is not a bird. It's not a plane. It's a ball trimmer sent from space. Uh, gentlemen, our friends over at Manscaped, they have been working night and day to bring you a below-the-waist grooming experience uh, that is unmatched with the brand-new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Talking about a next-generation trimmer, interchangeable blade heads for whatever shave your mind can imagine. Think about that, whatever you can imagine. Wow. Up upgrade your grooming game to the Ultra Sphere this year by going to manscaped.com. 20% off and free shipping, promo code VICE, high-tech, low prices, Manscaped. All right, so Hugh Freeze after the game says uh, open quarterback battle. Wow. And, and Hank Brown, who you've, you've talked to quite a bit, um, yeah. you led Auburn on the touchdown drive. Jeremiah Cobb got in the end zone, long pass as a part of that drive from, from Hank. I, I was a little surprised. I, I guess I am a little surprised because it was well known that Peyton battled the flu and missed like a week and a half of practice. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I, I don't know. I really don't like the, the approach that goes, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. It was still bad. Well, of course it matters or it should a little. So how much does it matter? How much should it matter? You said you're convinced that Auburn should take a quarterback mm -hmm. in the portal after the bowl game. I don't link the bowl game and the need for a quarterback as much, but but I think it's an interesting conversation. Yeah, I I think at some point, I don't know. I, I mean, at some point, we're going to run out of excuses. At some point, it's not going to be the receivers. At some point, it's not going to be the flu. And at some point, it's going to be, okay, we need to do something else at quarterback. Unless he takes a step forward, which he could. Yeah. He totally could, and I'm pulling for him, too. I think it's best thing for Auburn if he does do that this spring. But it's just... We were told for forever it's the scheme. And I mean, I, I believe that to some extent. And, and then receivers not stepping up and dropping passes. And they did that, right? Like Cam Brown dropped a few. Um, there were other guys that could have made plays on the ball. They didn't really seem to interested in, in fighting for the football or anything like that. Like that's not on Peyton. I get that. But then Hank comes in. And I'm not saying Hank Brown like should be the favorite to win the starting job. I'm not saying that. But for him to come in and we see a passing game that we haven't really seen all season, and the only way it was really stopped was because of a drop and then somebody not finishing their route, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, Cam Brown can catch passes consistently from someone. Shane Hooks can make sideline catches from somebody. What's going on? A catchable ball is a thing, Brad. And at some point, like, how did it look so much cleaner and so much more crisp with Hank than it did Holden Gurner, 
or Peyton Thorne. I think it raises, like, you got to ask more questions. You have to ask more questions because of what Hank did on those two series. Yeah, and that's that's where the multi-layered conversation comes in. We, we can't yeah. have simple conversations because it's not simple. It's not black and white. I don't know what the Maryland defense, what the secondary looked like. Again, I, I missed, full disclosure, I missed the whole second half of the game because I was at the arena setting up and doing film and stuff like that with basketball. Brad, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, Maryland had the reserves then or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because there have been guys that have been open and the inability to move off of your first target yeah. has hindered this offense. And Hank, who has played two seconds now in his college career in actual games, was making reads. He was looking downfield, check, check, went to the check down. And yeah. we haven't seen anybody really do that since Bo Nix was here, and he didn't do it as much as we would like. And so yeah. maybe maybe even go back to Jarrett Stidham. It's just not something we've seen a whole lot over the last few years. And he came in in his first snaps ever, and um, he had a torch. He had a torch, man. I, I guess, and I don't, yeah, I don't debate that. That's true. That is true. And I think that's, that's pretty objectively true sure but we were all so confident going into the bowl game and we've been all hyped up in the offseason going into next year I should say not everybody because I, I do read the comments and I understand that there have been people who go no you still got to get a quarterback it's not that but I mean I think the majority of folks have been really fired up going into next year because you go well the receiving room is going to get better and it's another year in the system for Peyton Thorne and there's all this confidence and I just I struggle a little bit with tearing that down because of the performance in a bowl game. But that just may be because my, again my filter, my lens on bowl games is really thick. I, I really I struggle to punch anything through that filter when it's a yeah. bowl game. Yeah, and that's okay. But if it's taking this long for you to build confidence. I don't know, like, how long are we supposed to do this for? How long are we supposed to really, like, work on Peyton Thorne's confidence at this point? Yeah. Like, I don't... Well, or the... Don't or the let, let me let me pitch you this, too. So, so right now, you're saying no to adding a transfer quarterback. Is that correct? Yes. Let me, let me pitch you this. Just let me make the logistics argument for you. If you're Hugh Freeze, you've talked about this publicly, and, and you and I have talked about it, I think everybody agrees... If you're going to get a transfer, you want the transfer to go through spring at any position, right? Yeah. Like that's not a crazy opinion. So it seems like that magic number of, as far as scholarship quarterbacks at Auburn is four. They want four on each team. They've got four right now with Robbie entering the portal. So they've got Peyton, they've got Holden Garner, they've got Hank Brown, Walker White is coming in. Yep. All those guys will go through spring. After spring, I just see, have a hard time believing, unless Holden Garner is the guy. I have a hard time believing that he'll stay. And I think there's a real chance that Hank outperforms Holden Garner this spring. I just, I just do. And so if he leaves, you're you only have three quarterbacks yeah. that went through spring. Do you get another one and almost make it as a, like a competition of like who's going to be my four guys? Uh maybe it it yeah, whether you want to be proactive about it, but that's you're making the assumption that somebody is going to leave. As I think this coaching staff should too. Yeah. Well, if they do that, then either they have a good idea somebody is going to leave, because that could that could happen. That's a part of those conversations. Is yeah. I want to wait till spring. I'm a little bit on the fence. I'm, I want to weigh my options after that. Um, so yeah, I I think we'll get a good idea for that. I think getting somebody before spring will be a pretty good indicator that somebody's probably leaving after. Mm -hmm. But unless somebody is giving you that indication, uh, transfer quarterback's gonna gonna dip into the NIL pool, and I think there are other areas of and I think we agree on that that there are other areas of need you'd like to dip into more than than for a quarterback who's you know going to command a pretty high number. Right, right, and so the the big, I guess, ticket quarterback right now that's still available as we record this Monday morning. Happy New Year, by the way, yeah. <laughs> is Cam Ward. And so we've all seen kind of these reported numbers that Cam Ward has been offered by Miami or if he's like, you know, thinking about going to the NFL, whatever it may be. If Auburn were to land him, it's like, wow. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of money we could invest into the defensive line. 
Yeah. Or you could get a, you probably get another, you know, you can get a left tackle and then scoot Dylan Wade inside if you need it. Like you could do a lot with that kind of money. I mean, it's, it's like, it's like the MLB salary cap. Like there's not a salary cap, but your cap is whatever amount of money that you have. And so yeah. if you're going to spend a big chunk of it on a one year rental, you got to make sure he's way better than the upside that you have on the roster. And uh, I know that co- I know the coaching staff is doing that. It just makes it as a it makes it an interesting conversation. And I don't know that it affects twenty five as much as it does. Just it's just a twenty four decision. And so yeah. if you're going to do that, if you're going to bring in a guy who has lots of starting experience in a Power Five school, and give him a hefty NIL contract to go with it, what you're not doing that for a guy to compete for a job. And he's not going to come to you to compete for a job, I don't think. I, I think he's coming to take a job. And I so, can't. Im- I can't imagine you paying somebody that much money, and you don't start them. Right. I think that played a factor. Not at quarterback, maybe at quarterback, but I, I think it played a factor at other positions too, where you, like you were paying a certain player so much money you felt almost more forced to play that player, even though they weren't the best player at their position. I do think that happens. And I do think that's a talking point that's happening within the locker room. Yeah, sure. And I want to be clear for for this. It's not, that sounds like pay for play. It's not, it's not pay for play. It is the NIL deal that they're getting with, with on to victory. And that's not the football program itself, but these guys know, they know what they're getting and, and they talk and yeah, it's it's not a secret. So those things right. are factored in. They are a major factor, and it's something that the coaches also you you have to you just have to you're being irresponsible if you don't. Yeah. So Auburn, depending on how you count a few guys, there are seven or eight scholarships left. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be shocked if a guy entered the portal this week, so that number could go up, Brad. But if that's the case, and Auburn wants to fill almost all of those going into spring, this is going to be a very busy week so be yeah. sure to click that subscribe button we will talk about it um several times this week here on the show but brad in the meantime that about does it for today's show it does lots coming up it's exciting we got to try not to jam it all into one show and uh, and remember to space it out so thank you for watching remember everyone has vices even if you got new year's resolutions you're still gonna have vices mm-hmm. make sure village vice is one of yours mm-hmm.